So uh, I'm going to talk uh, about today about a different topic than I sent the, uh, the abstract and title for, because Anshul talked me out of that talk. So the first like four <laughs> slides are like what you could read if you really wanted to, to know the details of that talk. And if you really don't like the talk I'm going to give instead, you can read them during my talk and ask me questions about them afterwards. Uh, <laughs> So mostly my lab's approach to science is to get a lot of data, and ideally we'd like this data, right? We want the data that scientists think is the most important data of the moment. Like how do you, how do you generate this if you want to understand how biological systems work directly from uh, large-scale data compendia? But of course you can't get someone to actually pay, you to pay for you to do this experiment because you know, it sounds insane, it's a fishing expedition, and you know, how do you know it would work? But if you have an internet connection, I hate to tell you this is at your fingertips. Uh, so if you just look at what's on Array Express, Geo, SRA, and ENA, you've got about 2.2 million samples to work with that are essentially genome-wide measurements of how biological systems are working. So there's a lot of power at your fingertips. You know, I think uh, one of the nice things that came out of, um, I think Alexis Battle mentioned it, which was that adding recount um, really helped us performance of for, part of the, for some of their methods, even though the data aren't you know, ideally suited to exactly the experimental design they were setting out to do. And that's something that we've found over and over again, which is that these data that aren't sort of designed for your purposes can easily be re uh, reused for them. And that's because most of these data are generally quite good. Like you always think, oh, public data, that's garbage, garbage in and garbage out. But in reality, most scientists aren't bad at their jobs. And most scientists, it turns out, want to generate good data because they would like to answer their own questions. And so the data that exists are actually quite good. Uh, so if you're interested, you can read uh, this paper. It's sort of a nice intro um, that just demonstrates if you look at these uh, public data compendia, you can extract pathway information from them. Um, this paper uh, sort of shows, oh, not only can you extract pathway information, but you can use that to go back and analyze uh, existing systems that we think we understand to identify new players uh, just directly from public data. And we've published a few things on this, so if you feel like um, poking around at this, this is the, the history that I would have recommended going through if I were going to actually give this talk. If you feel like doing any of this yourself with neural networks, uh, currently I think the variational autoencoder associated with this paper is probably the best place to start. Um, the student would probably like you to know that it's named Tybalt with the smirk cat emoji at the end. <laughs> that is an official part of the name. Uh, <laughs> so uh, enjoy that if you, if you feel like playing around with it. So the thing that Anshul really thought I should talk about is actually this. So part two, the, the talk you weren't ready for, um, which is how can we take data and essentially unlock it from silos using, uh, in this case, deep neural networks. And so uh, this was motivated in part uh, by an entire chain of events that started with this editorial in the New England Journal of Medicine, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Uh, but uh, Dan Longo and Jeff Drazen included the idea that there are certain people who uh, have at least been characterized as research parasites. And these are people who use someone else's data to do essentially science. Um, and of course I... <laughs> what? This room. This, yeah, like if you're in this room, you're a research parasite. I hate to tell you. Uh, it turns out we also started an award. So if you would like to win a research parasite award, uh, every year at PSB we give out a research parasite award. Um, there's a senior and a, and a junior parasite, so researchparasite.com. Uh, application deadline will be probably September, usually the end of September. You get a notification uh, mid-October. And for the junior parasite, I do my best to raise enough money to bring you to the meeting. So if you feel like going to Hawaii in January and you're a trainee, researchparasite.com. Uh, it all comes out of this paper. Um, one of the things that the New England Journal did in response to that paper was they hosted this New England Journal of Medicine Data Summit, uh, which included this Sprint Data Analysis Challenge. So this was their like, let's put the let's you know make these research parasites put their money where their mouth is and redo and do an analysis of a clinical trials data set that they're going to share. And we're like, oh, this is kind of fun. You know, we're research parasites. Let's show the New England Journal what's up. And so we go and we look at how to enter. Okay, you have to register. That's fine. That's not too hard. You have to apply for the Sprint data. Oh, that's kind of annoying. It requires an IRB approval or exemption certificate. Not really always my definition of an open data challenge, and it's not open to people who don't happen to have an IRB. Uh, so welcome only people at academic institutions or those institutions that have an IRB. Um, and of course, you had to sign a data use agreement by you and your institution. So it's like already the open data aren't that open. Huh? Six months 
months of course. Yeah. <laughs> well, the challenge was four months. So, <laughs> so this could potentially limit the number of people that could participate a little bit. And then you had to sort of answer some, some easy early questions and then submit findings. So great. You know, they're doing an open data challenge, and the first thing you hit is a brick wall. <laughs> And so what we said, is there anything actually interesting we can do with the data? Oh, the other thing I didn't tell you is they basically stripped anything you actually wanted from the data. So like you only know how many medications people are on, but not what medications they're on. Because <laughs> they didn't want you to go back and analyze that data and publish some finding that they hadn't yet published, right? Um, so it was a pretty crippled data set. So we said, well, what can we do that's interesting? So he said, could we make this data shareable? Like, and not just anonymizing it. So as you probably know, you know, just removing identifiers from data doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to guarantee anything about the anonymity of people who are, who are in that data set. I think you know, one of the examples, a bun uh, at least one person has brought up sort of the Netflix challenge. It's worth noting uh, they ended up having to cancel uh, some of these efforts after it became clear that by cross-referencing with IMDb, you could actually reveal the individuals who uh, movie ratings from Netflix. So uh, what we wanted to do, this is kind of the mission in this case. We want to pr the obligation to protect privacy prevents data sharing, so we understand why the IRB uh, rules are in place. But could we just simulate data that were realistic enough that they looked like something that you could use for your machine learning analysis? And then only at that point where you think you actually have something would you go through the hurdles of setting up like a data use agreement and, and doing all these downstream sort of paperwork that like you said earlier is six months of work, and I think that's a fair characterization. And so, uh, and we wanted to do it without having to sort of assume any certain distribution for the data or anything like this. And so what we did uh, to solve this was we used generative adversarial neural networks. So the way these things work, um, you've got two neural networks that play a part. We randomly draw values from coordinate space, feed them into one neural network. That neural network's objective is to create samples that fool the second neural network, which is a discriminator, that neural network is trying to identify if data are real or generated. And so that's the, the kind of final call. You train these two things against each other. Um, and after a while, ideally, your generator produces data that are indistinguishable from, from the real data. And you could imagine those would be data you might think about distributing. Um, and just for this trial, it was a two-arm trial, so we ended up using this thing called an auxiliary classifier GAN. Uh, the only difference, the main difference there is that you also generate a class label, and then your discriminator is also trying to, to deal with this class label. So, but essentially these two neural networks, uh, for all intents and purposes, basically, if you've ever played Balderdash, they're essentially playing Balderdash against each other, where one of them is sort of making up definitions and the other one's trying to figure out which are real or fake. Um, of course, you know, we weren't comfortable just using GANs in this case because while we can use GANs to, so these neural networks to generate data, it's not entirely clear that the data wouldn't be accidentally leaking individual information. And so uh, there's a lot of examples where um, these models can be attacked later to identify training examples. Um, you know, the risk uh, is somewhat hard to quantify, um, but we thought it was important to uh, be able to put some uh, bounds on, on the risk. And so we also incorporated into the GAN framework differential privacy. Um, the goal of differential privacy uh, is essentially to release enough data um, that are useful while, while providing plausible deniability uh, to participants. Um, and essentially the way, it, the way it's going to work um, is essentially sometimes when you're training the algorithm you lie. Uh, and so the basic framing of differential privacy is that you can imagine um, sometimes you get real information from participants and sometimes you get false information from participants. And if you do this in the right way um, and quantify it, you can figure out sort of how much you're leaking an individual's privacy. Um, in the case of a GAN, the process is a little bit different. Um, there's a point where we add noise and where we control how much any individual uh, can contribute to the overall, to the sort of stepwise progress um, down a gradient, but um, essentially the same, the same process holds. So every once in a while, we're essentially adding noise to the algorithm that provides individuals with plausible deniability. And so if you do this, uh, it's pretty straightforward. The downside is that it doesn't really work. Uh, <laughs> so um, it turns out that adding differential privacy to GANs, at least in our hands in this setting, um, turns out to, to, to essentially break the GAN. So just showing you how this breaks, uh, the, this is the data from the trial. So this is at the time of randomization. This is each month during the trial. Um, these are uh, systolic blood pressures. 
And um, what we've got here in purple are the blue data. The individuals are either on a standard, which is the light purple. You can't tell the difference between light and dark, but so standard or the intensive um, treatment. And this is the mean uh, blood pressure measure for these individuals. This is a GAN. The green is a GAN that is not privacy preserving. So it is a GAN, but it doesn't have differential privacy. And so you can see that works pretty nicely. The data look generally like the, the, um, the original data. Um, it turns out as soon as you add in differential privacy, things go entirely off the rails, right? Like these people's blood pressure spikes to insane levels. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, so this is, you know, the, the, there's something strange going on here. Um, we ended up uh, figuring out that essentially there's a few things you want to do. The first thing is the final epic is actually usually not very good in these cases. Um, and uh, often the GAN will essentially go off the rails, so you break the Nash equilibrium. Um, we have some guesses as to why this is, um, but uh, essentially I, I would say the main takeaway for those of you who aren't planning to use GANs for exactly this task is that um, certain types of neural network framings for these problems are um, particularly challenging to, to fit. Uh, into the, the exact task that you want to achieve. Yeah. Uh, the Wasserstein GAN. So we tried it actually, and in our hands it didn't work as well in this setting, but um, that came out essentially after we'd done most of this work. Uh, and so we didn't put a lot of effort into it, so it was like play with it for a week and see what you get because we're submitting the paper. Um. And so this is showing that the generative part is working in the discriminative when you're adding the differential privacy, what happens? Um, so the, the kind of paired, so what we ended up seeing is, I think in this case the Nash equilibrium broke down pretty badly. Um, I think this exact example is in the, the paper and you can see um, essentially the, the generator and the discriminator go off the rails together. Um, but um, yeah, the, dis, the generator seems to be... Generator, generator. Yeah. Um, in this case, I think it would it would succeed, and then the generator just fails to compensate in any way and, and starts to go off the rails. Um, it just seems like it's very difficult with a GAN in general to know whether you know the default mode of a GAN is it doesn't work. <laughs> it's true. You have the differential privacy, and it doesn't work. It's like well, that, that's just typical for a GAN, and, and yeah. the fact that it worked in the first case. Was so, yeah, so we do see that <laughs> it usually works in this setting without differential privacy. Um, now, like, it's a, re it's a very low dimensional data set, right? So I think in total they gave us 36 features, right? So it's like very low dimension. Yeah. It seems that sort of keeping the difference between the two trials kind of. Yeah. I mean, it's learned something. I don't deny that it's learned something, but it's. Uh, this doesn't have the, yeah, this is just the mean. Yeah. yeah. It, it's bad enough that I wouldn't recommend using these data. <laughs> this was our this doesn't work setting. Um, so one of the things that Brett found um, pretty quickly is that actually uh, a lot of times the GAN is essentially mode switching. So like it's chasing, the GAN and the discriminator are essentially, uh, sorry, the generator and the discriminator are essentially chasing each other around sort of high density parts of the, the um, solution space. And so uh, what he ended up doing to fix it um, was essentially just merging multiple epics. Uh, so he also under differential privacy um, and again using cross-validation only in the training portion of the data. So this is all in 4,000 samples sort of reserved for training these models. Um, ended up fitting uh, logistic regression or random forest classifiers on the generated data to identify where those, like the discriminator neural network, also were at least reasonably uh, challenged by the, the generated data. So if you do all this under differential privacy as well, uh, you can get a setting where your generated data look quite a lot like your, like your real data. And of course, then there's a few things you want to know. Um, one of the things that we most wanted to know, which is the only um, thing that I really wanted to highlight here is what if you took these and built a machine learning model on them and then applied that machine learning model back to, to held out real data? What happens? So um, this is looking at 2,000 samples that have never been encountered, about 2,000 samples that have never been encountered by um, either the GAN or the random forest 
or the logistic regression uh, method that were used to identify um, which epics were reasonable. And uh, so in this case, he's now building a model on uh, these data, on the original, so the, either the real data, the data generated by a non-private GAN, or the data generated by the privacy-preserving GAN, and uh, applying it to these held out real data. And so essentially this is asking how well does the model generalize? Epic, yeah. Uh, so, um, it, uh, so the way this works, um, this is actually if you just look at the last, how the model ends up after training. Um, so the training proceeds through multiple epics, okay. yeah. And uh, the multi-epic one is just the, um, the one where you sample from multiple epics that maximize uh, or that minimize the ability of logistic regression or a random forest to also do this prediction between whether it's real or generated. Um, Quick question. Yeah. Have you actually looked at where those epochs actually reside? Are they like some of the initial epochs or towards the end or? They're kind of, yeah, so they're not like the first few. Um, so there's, you know, the point where it, it fits reasonably well. Um, there's a supplement to the paper that I really think is, is nice. I mean, you see um, the model fits really quickly um, and then it essentially is at this Nash equilibrium for a while, and then it essentially blows up. Um, <laughs> and so, um, you know, they're basically between the time it fits and when it blows up. Um, so somewhere in the middle. And um, it's not always predictable how long you'll have before the thing goes off the rails, but often a few hundred epics and then things seem to break. Um, okay. So if you do this, um, this is sort of real data, mo uh, model trained on real data transferring to real data. So this should work. You shouldn't do better than a model trained on real data transferring to other real data. So that's the purple line. And what we see is um, whatever your cl classification method of choice was, um, whether it's logistic regression, random forest, SVM, or nearest neighbors, um, we get reasonably good performance um, whether or not uh, you're using, whether you're using uh, the private data or the real data, um, the thing we suggest in the paper is primarily picking this top 10, so this is the top 10 um, data set, but essentially pick multiple epics and then life is pretty good, so that's the one on the left. So if you pick multiple epics, things generally work pretty well. Um, I would note, well, there's a few things to note. So um, we also did this evaluation where we asked a clinician to uh, review the guidelines for the sprint trial and actually try to guess whether we hit, they were real data or generated data. So um, we're generally able to fool the clinician. We weren't able to reject the null that the clinician is unable to distinct, that the you know, clinician is essentially choosing randomly which data are real or fake. Um, just from sort of after, so this was all blinded. We then uh, asked the clinician his perspective and his perspective was that every once in a while the GAN will do things like assign someone with a very low blood pressure an additional, um, essentially an additional medication. <laughs> and it was sort of out, out of the guidelines of the trial. Um, and it does look like maybe the model does that a little more than real clinicians, although both of them do seem to break the rules every once in a while. Um, but uh, that result is also in the paper. So there's like, you could, I look at it and I'm like, okay, I think he can vaguely tell, but I couldn't reject the null that he, he couldn't tell over um, 100 generated blood pressure trajectories. You could potentially put in a bunch of rules in the modeling phase to say, hey, if anything goes above certain thresholds, bring it down. Yeah, yeah, so if you, uh, if you were willing to put that kind of structure in a priori, I think you would get better performance. Um, or you could also just throw out generated individuals that clearly break the rules of the trial. Um, might have to think about the privacy implications of the later one. But um, yeah, the former one I think you could do. Um, so I think there would be cases where um, that well, if you had real and fake data to compare and you were trying to differentiate, you could potentially tell if something that it was against the rules of the trial occurred, you knew it would have been done by a person. <laughs> um, so uh, 
limitations. Um, I do think it's important to note, as we've covered ad nauseum, uh, GANs are kind of a little bit difficult to work with. Um, the approach that we took here means that you know, your final epic doesn't have to be great as long as they're, it's going through some part of the space that is generating data that are reasonable. Um, so we can improve things for this problem a little bit, but um, you know, it's worth noting. Um, if you have mixed data types, um, I think you're gonna have a lot of trouble. Um, we didn't here, but it's worth, that's really important. Um, you need a lot of samples, and the, if you, when you add differential privacy, um, things will break at a level that it won't break at without differential privacy. Um, I have some thoughts on why this actually is, but um, it, it definitely makes the training uh, more challenging. So if you have a model that's already really difficult to fit, adding differential privacy is unlikely, I think, to help you out. Um, <laughs> but if you need differential privacy, that doesn't really matter. Like if you need differential privacy, you have to figure out how to get it to work. Um, and the biggest thing to know is that if you're spending money on compute already, when you add differential privacy right now, um, to, to do it effectively, you have to train with a batch size of one. So uh, life can get a little expensive a little quickly. Uh, so it's gonna eliminate some of the sort of efficiency gains you'd get with larger batches. Um, so things to know. So it works by adding noise and then clipping the gradient. And so to be able to quantify where you should clip the gradient given a certain amount of noise, the math has been worked out for a batch size of one. If anyone really wants to work out the math for higher batch sizes, we would love to <laughs> it. <laughs> it would make this much more uh, practical for very large data sets. Yeah, you're not really gonna. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't see a benefit to going to a GPU for this unless you, I mean, getting data out of RAM might still be faster, but um, yeah. So uh, this is available if you wanna take a look at it. Um, it's up on BioArchive. If you feel like playing around with the code itself, um, there's a GitHub repo. And um, also Stephen Wu from Aaron Roth Lab helped us with the incorporating differential privacy into the GAN. Um, Chris Williams was a high school student who worked in the group for a summer who really helped us sort of get the initial project off the ground in, in conjunction with Brett. And Brian Bird is the clinician we were able to fool. So that's always fun. Uh, he, he was a good sport. He came in, he was like, I'm willing to be blinded. I'm willing to see if I can figure out whether these things are real or fake. So um, he, he did a, a really nice job of going through the sprint trials and everything. Yeah. So can you publish or have you published the yeah, uh, it's an interesting question, actually. Um, so I think it should be fine to publish the data, um, but I think we need to figure out, like, so uh, how an IRB considers it. Um, so to me, there are no longer any individuals with, like, none of the data that you would generate from this have any actual individuals in it. And we can say what the cost of privacy is, and we can quantify that. Um, so um, I would be relatively comfortable using a reasonably acceptable privacy parameter to generate and share data. Um, but I don't think we have the sort of regulatory guidance that we would need to go ahead and actually do it. Um, so it's a, I think the, the I think if, if it's, when it, there's a technological solution that um, is reasonably robust, um, I think the regulatory problems are addressable, but um, I would say we have not uh, we have not shared it, and we have not um, taken that back to the IRB to ask uh, whether they consider this still to have human subjects in it. Yeah. Yeah. Does it just decrease smoothly, or is there a point where it fails um, We did look at that. Um, I don't think it was smooth. Like, I think there's, uh, you, I think you get an, in, initially things t tend to work um, pretty well. Uh, the, the improvement is pronounced early. 
Um, I, I, I'd have to go back uh, and look at the data in the repo to actually give you a, an answer um, that I re remember well enough to be confident in. Uh, so I'm going to defer that question. Uh, drop me an email, or we can chat afterwards with the code open, <laughs> or the results open. Yeah. Um, I will also say one of the fun things about working with Brett is that uh, we now have a new lab rule, which is that it turns out if you win an Emmy, you have to bring it to lab meeting. Um, so random bit of trivia, Brett also has an Emmy that he won for technical achievement. So this is Brett's Emmy, and the paper is scaling probabilistic models of genetic variation to millions of humans. So new rule. If any of you come to us for a postdoc and you win an Emmy, a Grammy, an Oscar, or a Tony, you have to bring it to lab meeting. Um, <laughs> so, so I want to talk a little bit about sort of how you can take this and use it in your own research. Because my guess is you probably aren't all creating privacy-preserving GAN. So that's probably not the exact problem you want to solve. But you probably are interested in some of these deep learning methods. So um, I'm also interested in them. So, I know, so I've looked into how you solve problems with them. So the first answer is you get a lot of things. right? So get a lot of data. Your life will be easier with lots and lots of data. I highly recommend it. Um, and then essentially label it perfectly. So imagine you're in a museum. So get all your lots and lots of data, get perfect labels. Wonderful. So this is good. Your job here is done. <laughs> your method is likely to work in this setting. Um, everyone has this type of problem, so we can stop now, right? <laughs> you have a lots and lots of well-labeled data? No? Does anyone not have lots and lots of well-labeled data? OK, I see a few hands coming up. So we'll talk a little bit more then. Um, so this is us, right? I'm like, oh, that's not me. Um, so I, one of the things we did over the last couple of years was uh, write a somewhat exhaustive, uh, or at least exhausting, review of um, deep learning in uh, biology and medicine. It all started with this random tweet, and it ended with this article. Well, it's not quite ended, but I got the uh, message from the editor while I was here on Wednesday that uh, the paper will be accepted if we make like two small edits. Uh, so finally, the, the odyssey will end. But it ended with this really um, relatively lengthy paper. Um, it's 60 odd pages of text, 500 odd references. Um, it goes through a lot of the things you might want to know if you're going to use these things and you're sort of getting an intro to them. Um, it's kind of, we actually wrote this uh, on GitHub using Markdown, so we can actually go back and do some interesting analysis of the writing process itself. So um, this is, oh man, my dates aren't coming up. So this is October. Um, and so in October, we sort of actually started. So the tweet was in August. We spent some time organizing via GitHub issues. The first part of the document got created in October. This is us writing the outline. Um, this is, let's see, January 2017. So our article is due to the journal like here. <laughs> so obviously, we missed the first deadline big time. Um, but we, do, we are writing at that point. Um, we then get to this point where we're like, OK, we should figure out exactly what else we want to add and whether we're ready to, to wrap it up. Uh, we realize, oh my god, there's a million things we want to still write. Um, the, the, we actually submit it to the journal here. So you can see like right before that, this is us filling in all the things we really want to write. Uh, the paper's under review for a while. We get the reviews back. Um, this is October 2017. So I think we got the reviews back right at the end of October, which is, you can see, this nice little peak. Um, and then. Uh, we continue writing to address the response to reviewers, and then we resubmitted. Um, and we ended up with way too much text in this. But it's kind of fun. You can go back and see everyone who was involved. Um, one of the really wild things about this story was that um, I was paging through the online version of Nature. <laughs> and um, I came across this article, which was like 2017 in review, the science events that shaped our year. So it was kind of fun. You read about when stars collide. You read about all this interesting stuff. You get to this table on the popular papers of 2017, and you're like, oh, cool, that's our paper. <laughs> so um, it turns out it was the most downloaded paper um, that was uploaded between April and June of 2017. Uh, and we went back and looked at the other bioarchive preprints that were there, and it turns out it was the most downloaded preprint of last year. So that was pretty exciting. Uh, and so here's some things we learned. So uh, one of the first things we learned is, um, you know, 
If your problem has structure, you should really probably impose it. Your life will be much easier, especially if you're working in a setting where you have limited amounts of data. Um, so for instance, if you can choose a convolutional neural network over a multi-layer perceptron where you, know, you have these fully connected layers, do that if your problem fits that, because your life will just be worlds easier. Um, this probably surprises no one. Um, one of the things, so we'll use the famous cat neuron picture, um, one of the things that's, that's kind of nice is that if you can do data augmentation, um, a lot of people are now using that in uh, settings where they're getting very nice performance, particularly with images. So data augmentation is, imagine this is your image, but imagine you don't really care what orientation it is. You want to find cats if they're right side up. You want to find cats if they're upside down. Or to be really meta, you want to find cat neurons if they're right side up. You want to find cat neurons if they're upside down. So just apply random transformations to your data. So if you, you can do this, just like flip your data, flip your input pictures. This is really popular like with histology slides where you know, the exact orientation isn't that important. So you can sort of pick um, a part of the image and then essentially just rotate that before feeding it into the, the neural network. Um, so this is always helpful, um, or it's often helpful as long as you, you don't actually transform something you intend to keep. Uh, another thing that's really nice, um, I recommend if you can do it, uh, try multitask learning. There's a whole bunch of different framings for this. I've just picked one here where you essentially uh, have a neural network that's optimized for multiple tasks um, in this exact framing. Um, the benefit of this is if there is shared structure in the way you answer the problems, uh, you can get a lot more out of um, having both predictors trained. Uh, because essentially, part of the, if part of the problem is the same and then part of the problem is different, you benefit from the labels and the parts of the problem that are the same. So it's a way to use your data a little more effectively, particularly if you have um, noisy training examples. Um, things that are worth knowing, uh, I don't know what exactly all your applications are, but people can really mess with them if they want to. Um, so this is an older paper, um, but the picture on the left, the neural network's pretty confident as a panda. This, it doesn't really know what it is, but sure, let's say nematode, it's not very confident. Um, and we're gonna add seven one thousandths of this picture to that picture. So just, what do you think it's gonna look like? Still like a panda. Still like a panda. What do you think the neural network's gonna think it is? Nematode. Nematode. I hear nematode, anyone else? Chicken, something arbitrary. Okay, gibbon. Did anyone get gibbon? <laughs> so this is a this is really actually this was just recently repopularized um, with a story about adversarial examples for humans. But um, yeah, so uh, people can kind of mess with these. So I don't know exactly what all your applications are, but if you're thinking about using them uh, in a setting that doesn't have humans in the loop, um, so. You know, I'm just gonna look at, for instance, clinical text. I'm gonna tell you what drug someone should be put on. Um, it might be worth thinking about what would happen if someone added random characters at the end, particularly if those random characters weren't random, but they were specifically designed to change some outcome of your, your predictions. Um, and you know, maybe this seems far-fetched that someone would care to do this, um, but you know, if, if state actors are willing to influence our election system, my guess is there, that there could be economic benefit or political benefit to influencing the way, for instance, people receive healthcare. So if we move to a fully automated system, I think being a little bit cognizant of these issues is wise. Um, if you think that this is only wild and crazy in these random pictures, here's stickers. Um, so this is a, a, to me, I would perceive this as a banana on a table. Um, the neural network also perce perceives that as a banana. If you put the sticker next to it, this is a toaster sticker. The neural network perceives it as a toaster. Um, so that's kind of fun. Um, these stickers, uh, the paper's pretty interesting. It was put up, uh, it's from December of last year. Um, it's worth taking a look at. Uh, they, they show some ability to generalize the sticker over multiple neural networks. Um, but it's, anyway, it's an interesting paper. It's worth knowing. People can mess with your neural networks if they want to. Um, this has some interesting properties, so you can actually use this, this property to improve the training of your neural network, so you can generate intentionally adversarial examples, and it, it works as sort of a regularization strategy for your neural network. Um, it's, I haven't seen a lot of people using it in the biomedical domain. Um, there was some work in sort of breast cancer mammography images, but um, 
maybe I've just missed some of the others, but that's where I saw it sort of most widely being used. So it's worth noting, it could be a problem, but you can also exploit it if you want to improve your training. Um, neural networks aren't unbiased, so as you're thinking about how to use them, don't make the mistake these authors did. Um, so the goal in this paper was to look at people's ID cards and predict whether they were criminals or not. <laughs> so you can imagine uh, this has some issues associated with it. Um, they argue that the algorithm, so they, they argue the algorithm or classifier has no subjective baggage, right? So it's unbiased. But you, you probably are training this with some labeled data. And if those labeled data have bias, your classifier will have all the biases of the labeled data. And um, you know, I think there's some interest in sort of training these types of models to predict what a physician's behavior would be and then just replicate that physician more cheaply. So if physicians have bias, we don't really want to just launder that bias through a neural network so that now it's harder for us to, to you know, measure and potentially remove from the system. So uh, it's definitely worth constantly going back to this and thinking about whether or not um, we may be encoding biases into these sort of predictive algorithms. Like the criminals don't have white Yeah. Good feature. <laughs> Good. Yeah. <laughs> that is interesting. Uh, yeah, I think it's an ID database of, I think it was um, like Chinese government ID pictures. Is that possible? I, do, I don't think it's mug shots. I think it's the ID pictures. I think they did at least not use mug shots, if I remember correctly. But it's, pop, I mean, there could be like, wouldn't surprise me if there's a socioeconomic difference. Um, and so that may give, give rise to um, some of the features that this picks up on, which could go to your white collared shirt. Um, anyway, worth noting. Um, this is always just a fun one to talk about, but um, <laughs> it's good to figure out like where your neural network doesn't work. So like exploring these cases where <laughs> There's a lot of these. Like, you don't have to just look at, pup, at the Chihuahua muffin. Um, there's an entire Twitter feed called Puppy Bagel, which will give you like parrot guacamole, puppies and bagels, sharpays and croissants. Uh, to be fair, one of those Chihuahuas is really weird. Oh, they're really hard to tell. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's not. It's not always easy. Like you really like this one. Like, like that one takes a lot of looking. <laughs> I'm just going to throw that out there. But, um, That's a chihuahua. It, I, I, I perceive this to be a chihuahua as well. <laughs> um, it may be named Muffin. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> yeah, so, so I, but, sorry, to get back to the point. I do think it's, it's helpful to, you know, explore, particularly if you have multiple classes and you see that there's a lot of errors between certain classes, you know, it can help you sort of set, understand a little bit more maybe about the structure of your problem and why it could be confusing. Um, I like this quote the, from uh, actually a postdoc in my lab. Um, he, he, this was his response. There was a blog post, and he responded to the blog post in the comments section. And I happened to be reading it, and I'm like, oh, this is a good point. And then I got to the bottom, I'm like, oh, that's my postdoc. That's good. Um, but he wrote, you know, on big data, data collection biases are, almost al are, are always, well, I might say almost always larger than statistical uncertainty. but. Um, but I think this is, is worth noting that essentially the process that generates the data that you're analyzing, just because you get a significant p-value doesn't mean uh, necessarily that you're, you're learning something meaningful. And I think the data collection bias is, is, is um, definitely worth uh, constantly considering. Um, and then I think it's worth uh, noting that there's a lot of interest now in explainable AI or in explainable deep learning. Um, often, I think we in biology have a little bit different goal in explanation than uh, the, the sort of standard image analysis uh, people do. So uh, what I see uh, often that they're generally looking for is sort of why did this neural network make exactly this prediction on exactly this example um, or on, on this sort of set of examples. And so it's more about sort of understanding how to uh, maybe make a better neural network for that problem. So it's a little bit about understanding how the algorithm is working. Um, in biology, I think we want to know a little bit more than that. So we want to know what the model is telling us about our underlying system. And we want to know how we can generate testable hypotheses from that um, that will tell us something new about how living systems work. And so um, you know, I think a lot of the sort of um, 
methods that are coming out of that field are going to be useful, but they're probably not going to be just a drop-in replacement for, oh, here's how life works. Like, I think there's going to be a fair amount of sort of um, relatively specific um, efforts that are going to be needed to make that next leap for us. Um, so, uh, you know, when, when I missed my how did the, why did the chicken cross the road joke, that's too bad. <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, so basically, you know, it, it, everyone means something different, so it's like the answer to the question of why did the chicken cross the road. That's why there's a chicken on this slide, sorry. <laughs> and, um, and finally, uh, I think the domain expertise is actually really important. Um, you know, if, we, if our model is we're going to you know, build the single best neural network that's going to solve all of biology or at least solve our specific problem in biology. I'm a little skeptical of that. I think where we're going to get a lot of value out is um, where you have humans in the loop, particularly the humans who have been working in a domain on a problem and who have lots and lots of data that never made it into a publication and that never made it into the public repository because now they have this sort of orthogonal kind of mental model in their mind of how the system works. And you might be able to shake that up by saying, when I look across lots of data, I see this. Or you might be able to highlight certain uh, things that they've seen before, but not actually put together in the same way. So I think human in the loop systems, particularly those that take advantage of our colleagues who are primarily biologists and benefit from their expertise, are going to be um, sort of most helpful as we move forward. So I want to thank the people who make this possible. Um, I uh, talked uh, actually almost entirely after I revised the talk. Uh, about work from uh, Jia Tan, who was a graduate student in the lab who did essentially a lot of the work in the first part, as well as a little bit from Greg Way. I just had one of his papers up, so the Tybalt Smirk Cat paper. Um, that's his, his repo. Um, and uh, Brett Bialu Jones did the privacy preserving GAN stuff, um, but he's now, both of the, he and Jia have graduated. Um, so the team of postdocs, uh, Jacqueline Taroni, Daniel Himmelstein, and Chi Wen Hu, who's here, uh, uh, do a lot of our, our research on. Um, applying these methods. Also, uh, Greg Way has done a lot with variational autoencoders. Um, and gene expression data, Daniel, uh, David Nicholson is uh, trying to just simply process all biomedical knowledge to figure out how living systems work. <laughs> uh, it's a somewhat audacious but fun project. Um, we have a team of programmers who help us build software, none of which I got to talk about, but Matt, Stephanie, um, Rich, Dongbo, and Kurt have been um, putting together um, some cool stuff. If you want lots of public data, uh, we will. We have things for you. Um, and Deepa Prasad's our UX designer who helps us make sure the things we build are actually things that people can and want to use. Um, collaborators, so for the differential privacy work, um, Stephen Wu from Aaron Roth's lab helped us with that. Uh, Brian Bird is a clinician who did the evaluations. Um, a bunch of people from Eb Hogan and a bunch of people from her lab helped with the very first papers that I spent almost no time on that I was supposed to talk about instead. Um, we use public data, so uh, especially the sprint trial um, for the privacy preserving GAN stuff, the people who generated that, thank you. Um, funding, the work here was mostly funded by, this was all pretty much funded by the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, so that grant, um, so thanks to them for that. And you can find us online. Uh, my research lab is greenlab.com. Uh, the Childhood Cancer Data Lab, which I also didn't talk about, is ccdatalab.org. Okay.